If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking with one of them in real life. Welcome to Back in America, the podcast. In a world full of changing technology, schools are incorporating the latest gadgets and trying to keep up. But at Ithaca Waldorf School, they're taking a different approach. News Channel 9's Julia LeBlanc shows us why administrators are sticking with tradition going back 100 years. Starting in Germany 100 years ago, Waldorf schools are now becoming more popular around the world. Families are just hungry for a different approach to education and they're finding that their children aren't learning in the standard ways and so they would like to f try something different. Not relying on technology, but getting back to the basics. Instead of testing students in the core subjects, they're doing more hands-on work, keeping a portfolio along the way. We are finding in our current generation that children are a little more uh, eager to move and because of the technology and the sort of attachment to screens. And though these children may not be taking exams, some of them may end up in the same profession as those who are. They're lawyers, they're doctors, there's the spectrum of, of all sorts of professions. Getting there, at least for now, with their hands and not a computer. In Ithaca, Julia LeBlanc, News Channel 9. I'm Stan Bertolo and this is Back in America. Today, I am at the Waldorf School of Princeton with Ellen Leibner, chair of the Pedagogical Section Council of North America and a teacher at the school. Ellen grew up in a kibbutz and then moved to the US at the age of 23. He married Tertia, the woman who recruited him to teach at Waldorf. He was a class teacher there for 18 years before directing the teacher's education program at Emerson College in England. Altogether, he has been involved in the Waldorf education system for almost 30 years. Now, anyone researching Waldorf School on Google quickly realize that the school has many fans, but also some skeptics. Thank you, Ellen, for taking the time today to share your personal story with me and to talk about your passion for education. So, Ellen, we are here in a classroom where you started teaching, right? Uh, I first taught in this classroom uh, about 14 years into my career, but yes, this is the school where I began my career. Wow, okay. So that's pretty part of your life. It's a huge part of my life. I'm, I'm 54 and I've been connected to this school for 30 years. I really want to go back to your personal history, but maybe before we do that, can you tell me in a few sentences what sets apart Waldorf? from other traditional school system? So I would say that at the heart of it is the emphasis on quality of relationships between teachers and students. The main teacher for most classes in a world of grade school stays with a class from anywhere between three years and eight years. I actually spent two entire eight-year cycles with two different classes, teaching them from first grade all the way through eighth. And so you get to know your students on a level that a teacher at a different school simply cannot. So as we walk into this room, uh, and maybe you can describe it for us, there are two large stone columns on the side. Do you want to describe and tell me what those columns represent? Yes, so uh, in the fifth grade, our students study ancient Greece. And when my second class was going through the school, I had a father in the class who ran a stone sculpture workshop across from Grounds for Sculpture in Hamilton, New Jersey. And I told him I really wish that my students could experience making Greek-like stone columns. My first class painted those on the walls of our classroom in the other building, but it's not quite the same. And he said, you know, as it happens, I have some leftover material limestone from a big project that we did and I'll be happy to donate it and bring all the tools and teach your students how to carve if you really want them to learn how to do that. And so we set up a little workshop outside here outdoors and he brought all the materials and all the tools and the safety goggles and the gloves and taught the children how to carve. For about three weeks I had a constant stream of teams working out there in these columns chiseling with the children from the younger grades upstairs looking through the windows green with envy mm -hmm. 
And then you also see that above the blackboard here is a, a Latin verse carved into uh, other limestone. And he came the next year when they were studying ancient Rome and taught them the technique for carving lettering right. on stone. And so we ended up putting both the columns and the lettering in the same classroom. And now, many, many years later, I find myself teaching in the room with the memories of years past. That's amazing. Now, is that typical, this experience, this hands-on experience, is it typical of the pedagogy here at Waldorf? Yes. So one of the core methodologies of the Waldorf School is to try to teach the children from experience through to concept. So if you can begin by doing and then have a conversation about what you did, and out of that extract a concept, the concept that you have lives in you in a completely different way mm -hmm. than if you are told some abstract thing about there were Greek columns and they were fluted, and that's all you know about it. Uh, one of my colleagues here had a daughter in that class, and he said they went over the Christmas vacation that year to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and when they were coming in, there are these fluted columns outside, and she said, Dad, I hope they didn't have to do those by hand. <laughs> you know, so that's a relationship right. that a child would have to something that they can never have by uh -huh. simple abstraction. Okay. Allow me to rewind a little bit and yes. go back to your first years. Um, I said in the intro that you grew up in Israel, mm -hmm. in a kibbutz. Yeah. What is a kibbutz? So uh, a kibbutz, in a nutshell, is a community where the members of the community own factories and agricultural practices and equipment and housing and all that in a kind of a collective way. Today, it is much more uh, differentiated than it was when I was growing up. Really, in my kibbutz, people had very, very little money, for instance, but all your needs were taken care of. So everybody, all the children got the same education and the uh -huh. same medical care and the same clothing and the same housing and uh, the housing for the members was was standard. Right. Uh, so it was a lot less individualized than it is anywhere else in the world. How did that impact your life? In the type of kibbutz that I grew up in, we didn't even uh, live with our parents. So from the time you came back from the hospital, you were sleeping in houses with your peers. And as, so a, as, a, as a baby, As right? a baby. So it's no longer like that there, but it was like that when I was growing up. So we were put in a baby house, and there was a woman whose job it was to spend nights in the baby house and take care of us if something was needed. And if there was a problem, then she could go and call my mother. But otherwise, mothers were expected to sleep well at night so they could go to work the next day. And then they would come, uh, if they were nursing, they would come a few times during the day to the baby house to feed. And then every day at four in the afternoon, all work stops and the parents go and pick up their children from whatever house they're in. And you go home from four until seven in the evening. In seven, we would all go to the communal dining hall, have supper. And then our parents would take us back to the dorm and we would be read a bedtime story and go to sleep. Wow. What about school? So school was in the same building where we slept. So mm -hmm. we had, there was a long hallway with four or five bedrooms where three or four of us would sleep during the night. Our house mother would wake us up in the morning, we would get dressed, and the classroom was in the same building. Okay. Uh, so we would have our, our schooling and sleeping and even eating in the same building. What kind of a student were you at the time? Well, in grade school, I was a really good student. Uh -huh. uh, I have a brother who's two years older. And when he went on to high school, which for us started in seventh grade, he developed a reputation as a goody-goody. And I was really embarrassed by that. So I was bound and determined when I got to the high school that nobody will think of me as a goody-goody. So for seventh, eighth, ninth grade, I was a troublemaker. And then I realized that the, the life that I was looking for, the meaning that I was looking for was not in being a, a troublemaker. So by 10th grade, I became a good student again. And did you already know what you wanted to do at the time? Oh, I was absolutely certain that I was going to be a philosopher and a physicist uh -huh. together. Okay. Okay. How so what drove you to come to the U.S.? And I'm sure you have a lot of experience between 
your time at school and the U.S., but if you want to sum it up, you know. So I actually came to the U.S. to study anthroposophy, which is the philosophy that underlies world of education. I met that in Israel, first as a teenager. So it was, there were people around me who were interested in Rudolf Steiner's work, and uh, I knew about it. I, I was not myself that interested at the time, but it was something I had heard about. And then when I was in the army, uh, everybody in Israel has to go oh. to the army, and I was in the army, and one I had a friend who was doing his reserve service in the army, and he s was studying philosophy at the university in Tel Aviv, and so he would come and we would talk about philosophy, and then one time he brought me uh, a Steiner book, an, an early philosophy book by Steiner, and said, I think you should really read this. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to read Steiner because I didn't have a very high... My brother was interested, and I thought, he's just a lost soul. Right. But I read it, and I realized, yes, this guy knew something about philosophy, and so I read some of his later works, maybe the more controversial works, a little bit more open-minded than I had been when I first tried reading them. And then I thought, this guy is either the most incredible teacher I'll ever meet or the biggest charlatan in history, and I better find out which it is. Uh, so I came to America to find out okay. which it is. And did you have any preconceived idea, or were you still pretty open-minded at the time? I was really open-minded with, with the one suspicion that I was afraid, because of some of the people that I met in Israel, that it would have a cult-like quality, that Steiner would be somehow an authority that he couldn't dispute, that he you would be somehow expected to speak the party line, that you would not be allowed to have your own thoughts. You know, the, the, the features of a cult have to do with control over the mind primarily. And so I was, my one concern was that maybe it was that. It's interesting you say that because, indeed, when you do research Waldorf on, on uh, Google, y you find people that say, hey, it might be a cult or a religion. So how did you make up your mind then? Wh what happened? Yeah, so I had, I, I had a little checklist in my own mind when I came to America, and I thought four things would make me leave. The first is forbidden thoughts. If there are thoughts you're not allowed to have, I'm out. Mm -hmm. you know, no nobody tells me what to think. Uh, the second is uh, if there are uh, no times when you're left alone. Right. You know, the third is if you're not allowed to leave the community without permission from somebody. And the fourth is if there's a moment where you have to give all your earthly possessions to somebody else. And that if any of those things ever happen, I'm out. It's now 32 years later. They haven't happened yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I somehow assume this is not going to happen. <laughs> So you mentioned control over the mind and the ideas you can have. Some people said they're opposed to vaccination. Is it true? So uh, people who follow Rudolf Steiner are as varied as, as any other group mm -hmm. of people with common interests. So, for instance, two years ago I spent a year teaching in a school in Pennsylvania and I was commuting, going there on Mondays, coming back here on Friday. And during the week I stayed in a home with an anthroposophical physician. And so he has a family practice, he's had it for years and years, and he, on the whole, ends up recommending vaccinations to most of his patients. Okay. So no, it is, there's no official position of anthroposophy. There are other anthroposophical doctors who are dead set against vaccinations, but there is no correct or official position of anthroposophy or of any Waldorf school that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, this school, our policy is we obey the law. So the laws of the state of New Jersey are what they are, and we abide by those laws. Right. Okay. So I think those were really the main question I could see on, on Google. What are some of the critics you may have come to, uh, across? Yeah. So one common concern uh, for a time was the, the, the science that we teach is not real science. And I read some of the articles that the, there was one man in particular who was writing about those. And I thought to myself, if he actually... Uh, if met teachers who said the things that he said they said, he is right to question mm -hmm. what we do, but it's not what I teach or what anybody that I know teaches. So uh, the the methodology of teaching science is different, but the the concepts are concepts. Right. Yeah. You you are not preaching that the the earth is flat or anything like no. that. No. <laughs> no. No. Sure. All right. So now that we. Uh, 
And so those questions, you fly to the U.S. to study anthropology. You meet your then-to-be wife after two years, and you end up living with her for quite some time. Seven years. Seven years before. Yeah, so the story was actually kind of cute because she was living at the time at the near the college where I was getting my the teacher seminar, and but teaching here already as well. And she tried to get me to come here for a visit, and I didn't know why anybody would want to work in New Jersey. You know, I, I lived in New York, and New Yorkers have a, a pretty snooty attitude about New Jersey, and I thought, why? I'm a young man. I can go anywhere I want. I'm not married. I don't have, you know, I'm cheap for schools to hire. I can pick any place. Why New Jersey of all places? But she was teaching the class that I had my practicum with, and I knew that I would have to see her twice a week. Mm-hmm. And I thought it would be really awkward if I would refuse to come for a visit and then have to see her. So I said, okay, I'll come for a visit. So she drove me down here, and I was only here for four hours, maybe. I met the faculty, and they left an impression on me that was kind of warm. They were warm people. And I went back to New York, and when the day came to decide where I wanted to go, I said, well, why not Princeton? They seem like a nice group. So based on a four-hour visit, I made an eight-year commitment wow. to come here and take a first grade. And a year later, she and I were living together, and seven more years after that, we were married. That's incredible. <laughs> as, and as you married Tertia, you both married Waldorf and this country, right? You yeah, she was American, so she was she already... Was a, yeah, she was it, American, yeah. Yeah. You married uh, the U.S. and yeah. you married the school system. I heard that you uh, collaborated on plays together, mm-hmm. and that left very strong memories. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so one of the things that I did uh, as, a, as a class teacher was I tried to write a play every year for my classes. Now, I know that I'm not a great playwright. Uh, I'm under no illusions about that, but it's, there's something w- really wonderful about a teacher looking at his students and saying what story do they need as a play and how do I write the lines that I want these children to speak and she taught an art of movement called Eurythmy which uh, is very easy to weave into plays Uh, and so she helped me the first few years just reading the plays and making suggestions and we would weave a little bit of movement into them but then the culmination of that was when my second class the one that ended up cover uh doing these columns, they were in fourth grade. They studied the Norse mythology. And I wanted to write a play about the death of Baldur, which is one of the big stories of Norse mythology, but to write it for Eurythmy, that the Eurythmy would be the main feature of the play. Uh And so I wrote the play with that in mind, and she and I then co-directed it. And it was, for me, a kind of peak of my career, and it was especially poignant because the following fall she was diagnosed with cancer and we never really collaborated on plays again. I mean she helped me a little bit with with some more work but we never did a full production like that together again. So that uh, is is the end of the first half of our life together. Was that almost a, a spiritual experience? Yeah, it was it it was deep and profound, and and th- what happened afterward made it all the more so. Mm. So you mentioned rhythmy. Um, how important is this dance in this education system? Well, you know there are schools that are not fortunate enough to have a eurythmy teacher, but I would say that for me it's essential. It's an it's an art of movement that combines music and speech, and spatial orientation and um, space between children as they move. Uh, I would say that if I had to teach one thing to children outside of my own lessons, that would be what I would want them to have. So when it's good, it's really wonderful. And the children, how do they react to it? Do they like it? Some of them hate it. Some of them love it. Uh, It also depends on the teacher. So as the children, usually when they're young, they like it pretty universally not all of them but but mm. it's uh, as they get older especially as they get to middle school the teacher has to be quite sensitive to the fact that expression of feeling through movement is a delicate thing for young teenagers 
And my late wife was very good about getting them, particularly the boys actually, to engage with her by understanding that it needed to be more dramatic and less feeling oriented. So plays and drama and let them feel their muscles a little bit and move with some strength and power. And uh, she had a, I think she had a real gift for working with middle school children in this. And, and I want to come back to that because I, I think we touch on, on a lot of very important um, topic when it comes to the development of children. But let's back up yet again a little bit. Mm -hmm. Here you are, a foreigner coming to the U.S. What was your first, was it the first time you came to the U.S. at that yes. time? Yes. What memory do you have of that time? My first distinct memory of the U.S. is driving into New York from my aunt's house in Westchester with my dad, who happened to be at the in the States at the same time. And he said, I'll take you into the city. Come with me, because he lived there as a child for a year. And so we arrived in Grand Central, and we came out of the train, and he bought me Hagen dazs ice cream. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, these things exist? <laughs> so that was my first memory. But then I came out into the street, and it looked exactly like I expected New York to look. Right. Just like it looks like in the movies and TV shows. and. Uh, and I had lived in Tel Aviv for a year uh, as, a, as an 18-year-old. Uh, the energy is very similar. Right. A big city, you know, okay. quick movement. Then when I went to begin my studies, uh, I felt really lonely quite a lot because I didn't understand the jokes. Mm. It takes a while to understand humor in a different language. And I didn't understand the sports. You know, baseball was a completely foreign language. I didn't I know anything about it. football. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and I grew up a boy in Israel. I liked soccer. Nobody here cared about soccer at all. And I liked American basketball, but it's only a few months out of the year. So I remember not getting the humor and not really getting the sports. Uh, and when my classmates got in our chorus leader's house to sing Christmas carols, I didn't know any of those songs at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so th a little bit of loneliness. But when I, uh, it took me about six months to realize that I wasn't going back to Israel. And the reason was that life seemed normal here. In Israel, it's so frenetic. Uh, everybody has to hear the news every hour, at least back then. You mm. know, it was a long time ago. And here, if you didn't hear the news for a week, you didn't miss much. <laughs> you know, people talked about the weather and, mm -hmm. you know, or sports and who cares. And it wasn't existential. And I thought for the kind of meditative work that I want to learn to do, this pace of life is really helpful. Right. Uh, and then I began meeting the students in the Waldorf School near my uh, college, and that's when I thought, maybe I want to become a teacher. Because they were seniors, and one of my classmates was renting r a room in the house of one of the senior girls. And so we would come there to visit our friend, and they would come there to visit their friend, and we began interacting. And I thought, wow. These are seniors in high school, and they look you right in the eye, not provocatively. They're not challenging you. They're interested. Mm -hmm. They ask you questions. You can have conversations with them. When I was their age, I was so cynical. I had no faith in the adult world. I thought the adults were phony. They were saying one thing and doing another. You know, we were going to go into the army, and so we had that on our mind. These kids were well-educated, well-spoken interested, friendly, they interacted with each other in a way that felt like they were brothers and sisters. And I thought, wow, I don't know what they did with these kids, but I like what I'm seeing. This is impressive. And so that's how I more or less decided to become a teacher. Yeah. Do you think your initial experience with Waldorf at the time has changed? I mean, has Waldorf really changed, or is it still the same kind of fundamental values? That's a really good question. And you know, I'm really different. Mm -hmm. It's 30 years later. Mm -hmm. And I've been through 30 years of work and a marriage and the death of my first wife and a second marriage and seeing the class that I took as six, seven-year-olds now in their late 30s. So my perspective is layered. You know, in the beginning, it was more like falling in love for the first time. You see something and they the, those kids looked so impressive. And then I went into the teacher seminar and the theories seemed so wonderful, all the art and all the practical work and all the music. And the, and then you go into the profession and you realize that not all the teachers are great and not all the families are supportive. 
and you make mistakes and so life becomes layered but i think life in general becomes layered right it's like marriage becomes layered sure sure uh-huh. so but, but, but the fundamental you know what is being taught here has it changed much yes and no so the principles are the same right that uh, idea that you begin with experience when you can and build up towards the concept that you use the arts mm-hmm. not as a separate subject but in everything right Uh, those things are still very much there that you uh, that you concentrate on your relationship with your students as as the core capacity that you have those things are still there the content has to evolve you know the way that it manifests itself has to grow today my sixth grader had a typing class on on tablets you say they had typing class on a tablet uh, I thought screens were not really welcome it depends on the age yeah so We're not encouraging young children to be exposed to screens simply because we don't think that it does anything good for them. So for a child, say, before the age of 10, certainly, what is it that would be really healthy for that child? Balance, throwing and catching, singing, playing music, running around, uh, playing with animals, mm-hmm. tending a garden, playing with friends, talking to the parents, cooking... Uh, things that involve all the multiplicity of senses and the muscles in the body. And a screen is a one-sided visual stimulation mm-hmm. from the outside that teaches them to be passive and to be consumers of entertainment rather than to create and do and grow and become. But as they get older, it is part of the reality of the world today that research is no longer done by going to the library and taking out books. And so th- well they have a course here called Cyber Civics. How do you use the cyber world in a way that is civically responsible? How do you avoid the pitfalls of uh, using the Internet and, and social networks in a way that damages you uh, and others, uh, sometimes for a very long time, right? So th- you leave traces behind you that are impossible mm-hmm. to erase. So uh, we try to teach them how to be citizens in the world that they're growing into, And part of that is knowing how to type on a computer correctly rather than learning with two fingers and sure so, so. yeah do you have any um, computer clubs maybe for those who wants to learn how to code or not in grade school here so schools that have a high school have those okay. sometimes when they have a high school they may begin that in seventh or eighth grade we haven't had that here yet mm. it may come but it hasn't yet happened okay so teens nowadays um, from um, you know high school going on um, do have to fight anxiety uh, you have a lot of suicide among teens uh, is that an issue you also faced with not really so of all the students that have been through the school since I came here one adult student committed suicide so as a percentage it's it's very very low of course Uh, I think that w- some of what we give them that is a real antidote to depression and suicide, not that it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Of course, children go through depression, teenagers go through depression, but depression is a, is a form of, of, of hopelessness. Mm-hmm. That you, uh, things are bad and you can't imagine that they're ever going to get any better. And one of the things that we give the children very, very strongly from kindergarten all the way through is storytelling. And storytelling builds imagination. We don't read them the stories, we tell them the stories. And so the teacher has to learn the story in pictures, tell it in pictures. And I teach history without a textbook. So I have to tell them about ancient Rome. We're starting a course, a history course in two weeks. I will tell them about Muhammad in the beginning of Islam, but not by reading a textbook, but by learning the stories and telling it to them. So you build imagination. And what imagination does is it allow you to, to see a reality that isn't, isn't yet there. And I think if you give children the tool to imagine where you might want to be at a different time, you give them a tool to cope with anxiety, excuse me, and depression that is quite powerful. So I can't say that it never happens, but uh, the consequences in among all of graduates seem to be much less yeah. severe. How do you deal with grades and failing a test so we don't give tests at all in the early grades uh, the idea is that they learn because the teacher makes it interesting okay. for them to learn 
I do give homework, but I still don't give tests. They get quizzes, but they don't get tests. Uh, in 7th and 8th grade here, because they leave at the end of 8th grade, you have to start getting them a culture to the idea of grades. And if you're going to give grades and they're going to mean something, failure needs to be an option. And so the question becomes then, what do you need to do with a given student so that they won't fail? And I would say that's another characteristic of world of education, that the, the responsibility maybe sometimes excessively rests with the teacher. So how do you teach this child so that this child doesn't fail? Now, of course, at some point they have to make an effort. You can't learn for them. One of the big frustrations of every teacher is that you can't learn for your students. Mm -hmm. You can only bring the horse to the water. At some point, the horse has to drink. And you can try to make the water interesting and nice tasting, nice smelling and nice looking and build a nicer trough. But at some point, the horse has to drink. Children who refuse to make an effort have to be failing courses, right? But uh, it's, not a common, it's not a common experience. Right. Here. And also parents that pay this much money are going to be willing to work with you most of the time to make sure that they're not wasting their money. Well, let's talk about that. What kind of tuition are we looking at? Yeah, so the, the school has a flexible tuition program, which is adjustable based on the income of the family. The nominal tuition in the grade school is in the low 20s now, uh, but families will pay quite a lot less than that if, if their income doesn't allow that. So the intention is to make it as accessible as possible, which is something that appeals to me a little bit also out of my kibbutz background. Right, so where I grew up, everybody got the same education. And I, as a teacher, bemoan the fact that people that I know would want their children in my classroom can't have their children here because they can't afford it. So the school can be as, as flexible as it can be, mm -hmm. but at some point, independent education costs money because it's not supported by tax dollars. Uh, the idea that maybe one day tax dollars would support your choice of education as opposed to the Board of Education's choice of education appeals to me. Right. I think that you as a father should be the person who decides what education your children should get. And your tax dollars should support that education and not the education that somebody else decides is the one that your children are going to get. But that's not really up to me. So we work within the confines of the system as it is, and we try to be as flexible as possible. Okay. Uh, but you know, as soon as you put a price on anything, it's too high for some people. Do you see kids uh, joining the school at any grade, or is it mostly in the early grades? Uh, no, I have three children who joined my class this year. Okay. So, and, and in fact, we had an open house here on Saturday, and I was giving a little presentation about science, and this woman sat there with her two children, and she looked vaguely familiar. I didn't recognize her, but she looked vag vaguely familiar. And... Uh, After the presentation was over, in the middle of the conversation, I uh, made a comment, and she mentioned my late wife by name, which shocked me. And I saw her afterwards, and she told me I am, she gave me her name, and she came here as an eighth grader, my second year at the school. So she joined the school's first class when they were in eighth grade. And I told her, you know, I've spoken about you in lectures that I've given about World of Education because sometimes a child will come here in eighth grade and all of a sudden it's like the, the clouds parted and the sun started shining. She said it was absolutely like that for me. I came here in eighth grade and my whole life changed. I so love singing and art and in my other school I couldn't do any of that. And I came here and every day we sang. And every day there was some artistic work and we did clay and we did painting and we sang and we played instruments. And uh, so now she's, she wants to bring her children here. So. That makes me think that transitioning to high school must be super tough. Not if you prepare them in the right way, I think. So I've told every eighth grade, and I've taught eighth grade five times. Mm -hmm. So I've only taken two classes, first to eighth. But then uh, my third class here, I taught for seventh and eighth. And then I taught in Pennsylvania, just in eighth grade. I came back here last year, just in eighth grade. And then I pick up a sixth grade here this year. So I've taught eighth grade more than any other class. And I always tell them, if you find yourself in high school in November, missing me or the school every day, I've done a bad job. Mm -hmm. So my job is to make you be where your shoes are. 
you need to be there and say, what's to be gained from being in this school today? Who are the teachers that have something to teach me? Who are the classmates that I can learn something from and do something with? Be where you are. Don't be in the past. Don't live where you used to be. Be where you are. There's always something good to be found in a school environment. Even if most of it is not to your liking, there's some good teachers and there's some good classes. Mm -hmm. Concentrate on that. Are you in touch with some of them? Yes, in fact, I've been to weddings of some of my students from really? my first class. and uh, Yeah, so when you spend eight years with a group of children, some of them really do stay in touch, and some of them come when they come home for Christmas. They'll mm -hmm. drop by to say hello. Or I had three students from my second class who every year got together. One of them lived about two blocks away from me in Hopewell, and once a year they would come knocking at the door, either uh, during the Christmas break or Easter break or... You know, and they would just come to hang out and talk about high school experiences and then college experiences, and mm -hmm. it was really fun. So, as I did my research, I found out that in uh, Finland, um, the world of school is being um, funded by the government. Yes. So that speaks for uh, your case, right? It speaks. I think it does. The Finland generally scores the highest in the PISA scores, right? So. Uh, in Finland, they do uh, use the, the world of system very extensively. The government does. Uh, I have to say, in fairness to my colleagues in the non-Waldorf world in America, th th Finland is great, but Finland is completely homogenous. It's much easier to teach in a culture where all the children speak the same mother tongue mm -hmm. and have the same culture. Teachers in America face a much tougher mm -hmm. challenge. And so... Let's be a little careful, assuming that because it works for the Finns, it will work anywhere. But I think there's a lot to be learned from world of approach for any system. What's next for the school? You know, what are some of the... Y you, you are an expert in pedagogy. You work with the school system. Um, what are some of the big projects you're working on or some big question you are trying to solve? So we are trying uh, at the moment to work on a few themes nationally and or continentally. One is uh, this question of screens. So you have a generation of children who come to you addicted to screens, and their parents are addicted to screens. Uh, most of us are addicted to our screens in one form or another. Uh, faculty meeting uh, has a 10-minute break. Everybody takes out their phones and checks their emails as if mm. the world will come to an end if you know it's another hour before you see your emails. So we, we are a society that's addicted to screens, and for children that has certain consequences. And so how do we do multisensory uh, education specifically with a knowledge of what isn't being developed? Uh, I think so that thing. The, the other is that now as vaccinations become mandatory, uh, what do we have to offer parents who would rather not vaccinate their children? Now they have to vaccinate their children. They're concerned that, that the illnesses that the children don't have will not allow the immune system to be developed in the way that they would like it to be developed. Regardless of what I think about that, if we think about the absence of fever experiences, for instance, because of, of these childhood illnesses, what would be a fever, pedagogical fever experience? How do you bring enthusiasm and care uh, and warmth to the education so that these parents can have their mind put at ease, mm -hmm. that we will try to help them with what they think their children are not getting. Do you think that this education is for every kid? Complicated. So it has to do with who the parents are and who the child is and who the teacher is that would be the main caregiver for the child at the school. In theory, yes, so if the parents really want this and the teacher is good, every child can be met. Mm -hmm. In reality, sometimes to meet the child, you need additional resources in special education and so on that the school may not have. Mm -hmm. Very often, the parents are not entirely supportive. They do things that undermine the education. The teachers are not experienced or not that good. So in practice, no. Uh, not every child will find their home in a world of school. So who would be your you know, ideal uh, student? So I think that the students who really thrive here are the students who really uh, are self-starters, the motivated students, which then generally do well everywhere, but they, uh, those that would love a multiplicity of challenges. 
they enjoy being challenged in the arts and in the practical work and in the intellectual work and in the social aspect of things and doing and creating uh, those that have a kind of inner uh, engine mm -hmm. that gets them curious about a lot of things in life they thrive here I would say I have a student in my current class who really has very severe learning challenges but he's happy to come to school according to the parents because he tells them my teacher really appreciates me mm. and so I think if the teacher can find a way to appreciate children even if they can't learn those children and teachers thrive together okay okay we are getting um, to the end of this interview I still have a couple of questions mm -hmm. I usually like to ask my guest uh, and in your case, it will make a lot of sense because you came from Israel. What is America to you? Well, I love America. I see a lot of problems in America, and I love America. I think that there are very few places in the world where a young foreigner can come and be established on completely equal footing to people who grew up in the culture. Mm. I worked in England for a year, as you mentioned in the introduction, and my impression was... I will never be English. Mm -hmm. I'm American mm. here. Okay. Uh, and I think that, that you are too. Mm -hmm. So you can have a foreign accent and you can have dual citizenship and you're really American. And that really appeals to me, the fact that you, m you make your own way here through your talents and effort. Mm -hmm. And your background matters less. It's not as you don't have to know all the right words in order to be accepted here. Uh, so that's one thing that America is to me. It is also a land that's incredibly in love with itself, uh, which is bizarre from somebody who comes from a different country, how little they care about other places. <laughs> so uh, I read somewhere about a European wit who came to America and said, if you want to uh, experience a miracle, buy an American newspaper and see your country disappear. <laughs> you know, they don't care, they don't know. Uh, so there's that kind of provincialism about the country that is amusing. Right. Uh, how little they know about what happens in the rest of the world. Uh, and sometimes it's obnoxious because it's only America is the greatest and the best. And sometimes it's endearing uh, because they are still welcoming. Right. So they treat us foreigners a little bit like welcome. Now that you're here in the real place, in the good, in the important place, welcome and let's not worry about your old country anymore. Right? Okay. Finally, are there any books or movies that you would recommend? Yeah, I like movies. Uh, a movie that really touched me very deeply and, and felt to me like the people who made it knew something about the spiritual life uh, is What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams, uh, really. So I recommend that for people who haven't okay. seen it. Okay. Uh, I really like an old movie that very few people have ever seen called Round Midnight, which is about an American jazz saxophone player mm. in Paris, mm -hmm. played by Dexter Gordon, who's one of my favorite jazz musicians. I, I think really incredibly moving mm -hmm. film that I saw as a young person in Israel. It was the only movie that I went to over and over and over again when I had to pay for it. Wow. Okay. So those two. Okay, good. Are there any questions which I haven't asked that I should have asked? I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, I think you ask good questions. I, I, I think my wish maybe for children everywhere, not just in a world of school, but everywhere, is that education peels away from the emphasis on standardized testing and focuses on relationships. I think that education is primarily relationships. It's what Rudolf Steiner, towards the end of his life, <coughs> after working for five years with the teachers in the first school, in the last lecture cycle that he gave about education, said the most important thing in education is what passes between the soul of the teacher and the soul of the student. And the longer I teach, the more I see what he means. And it's not what I teach you to know, it's how I teach you to be. And I do that by looking in your eyes. Mm -hmm. and shaking your hand in the morning and knowing something about you and caring about you in a way that transcends the business math or the history or the physiology that I'm teaching you. And I think that education, by and large, has gone in the exact opposite direction. Education is all about content. 
in, in, in the world at large. And I hope for children that that changes. I hope that, not, that, that our emphasis on relationship is embraced regardless of what people think about our curriculum. Good. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks.